In 485 BC, the land of Israel, conquered by the Babylonians, was a wasteland, uninhabited except for a few peasants eking out a bare existence. This was the land God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants forever. For all the land your eye can see, to you I will give it, and to your descendants forever. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. The once proud inhabitants of the Promised Land had been slaughtered, scattered, and carried to Babylon, where they had spent 70 years, as Jeremiah had prophesied. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and you shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Many Jews had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, but the city itself still lay desolate, its walls broken down and its gates burned. In that hopeless hour, God spoke through Zechariah, one of the most remarkable prophecies ever recorded. It concerned what the Bible calls the last days. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. The fulfillment of this prophecy following the amazing rebirth of Israel in 1948 has been witnessed by the world. Exactly as the Bible foretold, not New York, Berlin, or Moscow, but tiny Jerusalem is the world's greatest burden. So great is it that the United Nations Security Council has devoted nearly a third of its deliberations to Israel, which has one thousandth of the Earth's population. Jerusalem would not be the UN's number one problem if Israel could be pushed around, but her military is the best in the world. In that day will I make the governors of Judah a torch of fire, and they shall devour all the people round about. The Lord shall defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Exactly as foretold, Israel has devoured her attackers, winning every war against overwhelming odds. Angel Gabriel told Daniel that Jerusalem would be rebuilt, that 483 years later, Messiah would come. His own people, Israel, would reject and crucify him, and the city and temple would be destroyed again. And so it happened. And after shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the very day prophesied, was hailed as the Messiah, then rejected. Jesus prophesied, Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they shall be led away captive into all nations. In AD 70, exactly as Jesus foretold, the Roman armies under Titus sacked Jerusalem and left not one stone of Herod's temple upon another. More than a million Jews were killed, and the remnant were scattered to every nation. You shall be plucked from off the land you are about to possess, and the Lord shall scatter you among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. Israel's prophets also foretold the anti-Semitism that would pursue the Jews everywhere. To be a curse, an astonishment, and a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations. 
Scattered to every nation, Jews have been hated, persecuted, and killed like no other people, while the barren land of Israel continued to mourn. In 1867, a visiting Mark Twain wrote, Bethlehem, where the angels sang, is untenanted of any living creature. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes, desolate and unlovely. In another remarkable prophecy, Jesus declared, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jerusalem has been fought over by every major power in history. The Babylonians held it, then the Medes and Persians. Alexander the Great took Palestine for the Greeks in 333 BC. Later, the Egyptians and Syrians alternately had it until the Romans. Islamic invaders took control to be replaced by the Crusaders. Later, the Islamic Mamluks of Egypt possessed Jerusalem. Then the Ottoman Turkish Empire ruled for about 400 years. And all through these centuries, the Jews lived there and suffered. Fulfilled Bible prophecies concerning Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jew provide irrefutable proof of God's existence and that the Bible is true. Most people think the Roman Catholic Crusaders freed the Holy Land for the Jews. In fact, they slaughtered the Jews and took that land for the Catholic Church. Pope Urban II, who organized the First Crusade, urged the Crusaders to start upon the road to the Holy Sepulchre to wrest that land from the wicked race and subject it to yourselves. Hordes of volunteers under the banner of the cross massacred Christ's earthly brethren, the Jews, all along the route to Jerusalem. The crusade leader, Godfrey of Bouillon, vowed to avenge the blood of Jesus upon the Jews, leaving not one alive. Upon taking the city of David, the crusaders chased the Jews into the synagogue and set it ablaze. Succeeding popes treated Jews as lepers without rights. Among them, Pius VII, Leo XII, Pius VIII, Gregory XVI. Hitler's abuse of German Jews leading up to World War II uncovered a simmering anti-Semitism that was actually worldwide. The ocean liner St. Louis, crammed with 1,100 Jewish refugees, was turned away from every port in South, Central, and North America. Those 700 had valid papers for entering the U.S. President Roosevelt sent them back to perish in Hitler's ovens. Even Switzerland turned fleeing Jews back to their murderers and acted as Hitler's banker, holding billions of dollars for the Nazis in gold and funds stolen from Jewish victims. By the end of World War II, God's promise to bring his chosen people back into their land seemed more preposterous than ever. Six million Jews had perished in Hitler's Holocaust, a fact which many continue to deny. Yet Adolf Eichmann, in his memoirs written in prison, called the slaughter of the Jews, quote, the most enormous crime, the biggest dance of death in the history of mankind. Incredibly, hundreds of skeletal survivors of extermination camps upon their release at the end of the war were murdered all across Europe. Yet God's promises were sure. From 1945 to 1948, in spite of a cruel British naval blockade, 10 aging ships smuggled about 70,000 Holocaust survivors into the Promised Land. As one of them who made it said, It was better to risk dangers at sea and the British fleet than to stay in Europe. For the first time in years, we had a purpose. 
to create a Jewish state. Millions of Jews have returned to Israel from more than 100 countries. Israel's existence today in the Promised Land is undeniably God's doing. Behold, I will bring them from the north, from the coasts of the earth. He that scattered Israel will gather him. The United Nations adopted UN Resolution 181 in November 1947. It partitioned Palestine, giving 18% to the Jews and 82% to the Arabs, and made Jerusalem an international city never to be under Jewish control, as the Vatican also insisted. The Arab world rejected the UN decision, demanded all of Palestine. <laughs> To this day, no Arab map shows Israel's existence. May 14, 1948, Israel declared independence. It was immediately invaded by six Arab nations. These armies outnumbered the Jewish settlers many times over and had overwhelming superiority in weapons, tanks, and planes. Given an indefensible narrow strip of land by the UN and attacked by enemies determined to exterminate her, Israel should have been annihilated. But to the astonishment of a watching world that was cheering for the other side, the Israeli settlers soundly defeated their would-be destroyers exactly as God had promised. And so it has been in war after war, as her enemies have repeatedly attacked to annihilate Israel. Yes, annihilation is their determined purpose. Muslims have a religious duty to exterminate the Jews. They dream of destroying Israel and hold celebrations to honor murderers of innocent Israeli citizens. Islamic fundamentalism is now sweeping the world. Muhammad himself declared, The last hour will not come before the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims kill them. Yet the media calls Muslim terrorists radicals and extremists. In fact, they are simply being true to Islam. The Quran declares, Take not the Jews and Christians as friends. Slay the idolaters wherever you find them, besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. Hitlerian threats pour continuously from Muslim religious and political leaders on TV and over radios and loudspeakers, in mosque and street. When Qaddafi screams, the battle with Israel will be such, that Israel will cease to exist, he speaks for all. The extermination of Israel is bred into Muslims in their mother's milk. A Syrian minister of education wrote, The hatred which we indoctrinate into the minds of our children from birth is sacred. A ninth grade textbook in Egypt declares, Israel shall not live if the Arabs stand first in their hatred. And a fifth grade textbook says, the Arabs do not cease to act for the extermination of Israel. Israel is insane to attempt peace with such enemies, but worldwide pressure forces her to. In the Yom Kippur War of 1973, thousands of tanks swept simultaneously across the Sinai from Egypt and down the Golan from Syria in a carefully coordinated sneak attack. Israel's military forces were all on leave, celebrating the holiest of Jewish religious holidays, and it took three days to fully mobilize. 300,000 Israelis fought 1.2 million Arabs. Teetering on the brink of defeat, Israel's casualties were heavy, but in undeniable fulfillment, of Zechariah's astonishing prophecy, 
that Jewish forces would be like fire to devour the surrounding nations, Israel routed her enemies. In retaliation for Israel defending itself, 61 nations broke diplomatic relations with her, but none rebuked the Arabs for their sneak attack. Israel's desperate and costly self-defense is consistently portrayed as wanton aggression against its peace-loving neighbors. Anti-Semitism motivates world media, which is largely controlled by oil interests. Not a word of criticism appears in response to repeated Arab vows to exterminate Israel. When Israel deported 400 Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists, who had murdered and maimed hundreds of Israeli citizens, there was a hue and cry in world media and condemnation by the United Nations. But when Kuwait deported 300,000 Palestinians, mostly innocent civilians, the media hardly noticed and the UN ignored it. The United Nations is blatantly pro-Arab and anti-Israel. The UN's, quote, peacekeeping force, unquote, in Lebanon sheltered PLO terrorists, allowed them to use UN facilities for training, gave them military equipment, and assisted terrorist squads on their way to attack Israel. When Israel in desperation finally invaded southern Lebanon to clear out the PLO, it uncovered within the UN area caches of enough military hardware to sustain a million man invasion. Most of it, interestingly enough, was too sophisticated for the PLO to operate and was obviously intended for a Soviet invasion. The United Nations has condemned Israel more than 370 times for defending itself, but has never condemned the terrorists and aggressors who attack her. Two years after the PLO's murder of 11 Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics, terrorist leader Arafat was invited to address the UN General Assembly and given a hero's welcome, though he called for an end to Israel's existence. UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali declared, The Jews must give up their status as a nation and Israel as a state and assimilate as a community in the Arab world. Temple Mount on the summit of Mount Moriah is the heart of Jerusalem. This 35-acre parcel arouses such explosive passions that it could trigger World War III at any time. This is where Abraham obediently built an altar and bound his son Isaac upon it to offer him as a sacrifice to God. But God stopped him and provided a ram in Isaac's place. 900 years later, about 3,000 years ago, that sacred ground was purchased by King David from Ornan the Jebusite to build there an altar to God. And it was there that Solomon built the first temple. The Jewish temple, twice destroyed, is gone. In its place sits the Dome of the Rock, a monument to Islam's Jew-hating moon god, Allah. Israel's capture of East Jerusalem in 1967, and with it, the Temple Mount, seemed to contradict Christ's prophecy of Jerusalem being trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until his return. But incredibly, Israel immediately gave the Temple Mount back to the custodial care of King Hussein of Jordan, who turned it over in 1994 to Yasser Arafat and his PLO. Thus, the very heart of Jerusalem remains in Gentile hands, and the Gentile nations of the world demand control. Central to the Middle East conflict today is the issue of the so-called Palestinian people. The Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, headed by Yasser Arafat since 1969, claims to represent the Palestinians. The PLO declares, The struggle with the Zionist enemy is not a struggle about Israel's borders, but about Israel's existence. The PLO, as everyone ought to know, is an Islamic terrorist organization. 
It trained Idi Amin's murder gangs who killed about 300,000 black Christians in Uganda. Most terrorist organizations, in fact, around the world were trained by the PLO. Arafat committed his first murder at age 20. Under him, the PLO became the largest, wealthiest, and most vicious and bloodiest terrorist organization ever known. By 1970, the PLO had 55 bases in Jordan, and its continued terrorism against Jordanian civilians was so vicious that King Hussein turned his Bedouin troops on them, and after weeks of bloody fighting, chased the PLO into Lebanon. There the PLO wiped out the Christian towns of Damur, Bait Malat, Tal Abbas, and others. Its reign of terror in Lebanon went largely unreported. The international press was cowed into silence by the brutal murder of those who dared to tell the truth. Larry Buckman and Sean Tulin of ABC TV, Mark Trion of Free Belgium Radio, Robert Pfeffer of Der Spiegel, and others, about 300,000 Lebanese civilians, were murdered and more than 100,000 surviving young girls were left pregnant in the PLO's rape of that country before the Israelis expelled them. Yet Israel again was painted the villain. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arafat, Chairman of the Executive Council of the Palestine Liberation Organization, His Excellency Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, the President of the United States. Any peace agreements with PLO are a pretense intended to deceive Israel. The example Muslims follow today was set by Muhammad. In 628, he made a 10-year peace treaty with his own Quraysh tribe in Mecca. Two years later, he attacked Mecca and slaughtered every male and took the women and children slaves. Arafat has publicly declared, In the name of Allah, I am not considering it more than the agreement signed between our Prophet Muhammad and the Quraysh tribe. Peace for us means the destruction of Israel. The first step is to pretend peace in order to obtain territories inside Israel from which to launch her final destruction. Incredibly, Arafat and his PLO murders have been sanitized and lionized by world media. This ruthless, sadistic criminal was given the Nobel Peace Prize and is honored as the champion of justice for the oppressed Palestinian people. Palestinians? <laughs> there never was a Palestinian people, nation, language, culture, religion, or economy. The claims of descent from a Palestinian people who supposedly lived for thousands of years in a land called Palestine is a deliberate lie. That land was called Canaan, inhabited by Canaanites. What had been Canaan became the land of Israel when God gave it to his people. Yet a revised history which hides the truth is promoted in the best of encyclopedias and reference volumes, even Christian publications. Those who today call themselves Palestinians are Arabs by birth, language, Islamic religion, and culture. The name Palestine comes from the Philistines, ancient Israel's chief enemies. In A.D. 130, the Romans rebuilt Jerusalem as a pagan city with a temple to Jupiter where the Jewish temple had stood. Provoked to rebellion, about 500,000 Jews were killed and thousands sold into slavery. The Romans angrily renamed the land of Israel Syria, Palestine and that's where the name comes from. From that time, Jews living there became known as Palestinians. During World War II, the British Army had a Palestinian brigade made up entirely of Jewish volunteers. The Palestinian Symphony Orchestra was all Jewish, and the Palestine Post was a Jewish newspaper. In 1948, Arabs who had fled from Israel began to claim that they were the true Palestinians, and that Israel had always belonged to them. World media eagerly promotes that lie. 
The truth is that in 1948, Arabs owned a mere 3% of so-called Palestine. Israel's claim to the land goes back 4,000 years to Abraham's purchase of the cave of Machpelah in Hebrew. There, Abraham buried his wife, Sarah. And there, Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah are buried. In Hebron, David was crowned king. This sacred Jewish site has no relationship to Arabs or Islam. Yet, Muslims, in spite of a continuous Jewish presence there for 3,000 years, claim Hebron as their own. They build a mosque and they are determined to drive out every Jewish resident. For 50 years, the world has faced the problem of hundreds of thousands of so-called Palestinian refugees from the 1948 War of Independence. Typical of its lies, world media accuses the Jews of ruthlessly dispossessing the native population. In fact, the Arab High Command urgently warned Arabs by radio to get out of Palestine while they slaughtered the Jews. About 350,000 fled. Many did not. Those who remained are Israeli citizens and today comprise about 16% of Israel's voters. Jordan annexed the UN designated Palestinian territory, expelled all Jews, destroyed all Jewish houses of worship, and renamed as West Bank what had been Judea and Samaria since Bible times, in spite of billions of dollars in oil revenues and a land mass 700 times greater than Israel, Arab nations have refused to absorb any 1948 refugees into normal life. Now numbering in the millions due to a high birth rate and occupying shameful refugee camps in Gaza, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and the West Bank, these unfortunate pawns are deliberately kept on display. In contrast, the fledgling state of Israel, with a population at the time of 600,000, quickly absorbed 820,000 Jewish refugees who fled from Arab lands where for 1,300 years, since the advent of Islam, Jews were routinely beaten and spat upon in the markets and streets hundreds would be brutalized and killed in random bursts of violence by Muslim mobs and their property confiscated. Israel's rebirth provided a welcome refuge to which they fled. Israel has absorbed millions of immigrants. More than a million Palestinians in refugee camps came under Israeli control in the 1967 Six-Day War. Israel offers them state land electricity, sanitation, streets and schools, and has built nine residential projects housing 10,000 families. Arab nations, incredibly, oppose Israel's help for the refugees. Even more incredible, the United Nations annually adopts the following amazing resolutions. The General Assembly demands that Israel desist from the resettlement of Palestine refugees in the Gaza Strip. The General Assembly called once again upon Israel to refrain from any action that leads to the resettlement of Palestine refugees in the West Bank. Going back 3,000 years, Jerusalem was always the capital of Israel under her kings. Modern Israel has its Knesset there but the world's nations locate their embassies elsewhere. While visiting Jerusalem in 1998, the Vatican's foreign minister called the Israeli presence in East Jerusalem, quote, illegal occupation, unquote. In March 1999, Israel was notified again that the European Union does not recognize Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem. In a papal bull on the year 2000 Jubilee, John Paul II once again rejected Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem. In mid-February 2000, the Vatican signed an agreement with the PLO calling for, quote, international guarantees to preserve Jerusalem under international control. Roman Catholicism and Islam are Israel's two major enemies. 
Pope John Paul II has warmly received Yasser Arafat, that terrorist, many times, beginning when he was at the height of his career as the world's most notorious murderer and criminal. Pope John Paul II has piously condemned anti-Semitism, as he should, but he has apologized only for what, quote, the sons and daughters of the church, unquote, have done. Never has he admitted that the Inquisition and slaughter of Jews and evangelical Christians were official policy of the church and its popes. Rome insists to this day that Catholics, not Jews, are God's chosen people. A 1928 Vatican decree, for example, referred to Jews as, quote, the people formerly chosen by God, unquote. The Second Vatican Council in 1965 affirmed that, quote, the church is the new people of God, unquote. Catholic Rome calls itself the holy city, the city of God, the eternal city, titles God gave Jerusalem. Instead of rebuking Arafat for his passion to annihilate Israel and for his anti-Christian Islamic beliefs, the Pope accepted Arafat's invitation to join him in Bethlehem to celebrate, quote, our Jesus Christ, unquote. Our Jesus Christ? Arafat says Jesus was a Palestinian freedom fighter against Israel, and the Pope smiles and blesses him. Jews blame Christ and Christianity for Catholicism's anti-Semitism. But Catholicism, with its false gospel of works and sacraments, purgatory, and indulgences is not biblical Christianity. No true Christian could be anti-Semitic. Jesus was a Jew. In fact, the Catholic Church has killed far more Christians than it has Jews. Pope Innocent III massacred the entire city of Bézier, France, about 60,000 Albigensian Christians, and he called it the crowning achievement of his papacy. It took the Pope's armies a century to exterminate the Albigenses. The same fate was meted out to the Valdenses, Huguenots, Hussites, and others. In St. Bartholomew's massacre, 70,000 Huguenots were slaughtered, another 200,000 slain later, and about 500,000 fled France for their lives. Examples could be multiplied. Hitler could not have murdered six million Jews without the centuries of church-sponsored anti-Semitism preparing the way. On April 26, 1933, the Fuhrer reminded Vatican representatives Bishop Berning and Monsignor Steinmann that for 1,500 years their church had regarded Jews as parasites to be killed and that he intended, quote, a final solution to the Jewish problem, unquote. Before he became Pope Pius XII, Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, when he was papal nuncio to Germany, had given Vatican money to Hitler to help start the Nazi party. Upon becoming Pope, Pacelli sent a condescending message to the Fuhrer. To the illustrious Herr Adolf Hitler, Fuhrer and Chancellor of the German Reich, we recall with great pleasure that many years we spent in Germany as apostolic nuncio, when we did all in our power to establish harmonious relations between church and state. Now, how much more ardently do we pray to reach that goal? This was 1939, and Hitler's abuse of and intention for the Jews had been fully exposed to the world. In January of that year, Hitler had warned that the outbreak of war would result in the, quote, extermination of the Jewish race, unquote. Four years later, on June 22, 1943, 
with the smoke of incinerated Jews hanging in the air across Europe. Pope Pius XII, opposing God's promises, wrote to President Roosevelt arguing against making Palestine a Jewish homeland. There's no axiom in history to substantiate the necessity of a people returning to a country they left 19 centuries before. If a Hebrew home is desired, it would not be too difficult to find a more fitting territory than Palestine. With an increase in the Jewish population there, grave new problems would arise. No axiom in history, but God had promised it. Pius XII never spoke out publicly against the Holocaust, nor did he attempt privately to dissuade Hitler from annihilating the Jews but he expressed himself very forcefully against the return of Jews to the land of Israel, which God had given them as an heritage forever. So had Pius X back in 1904 declaring, quote, we cannot recognize the Jewish people. In 1919, Cardinal Pietro Gaspari, Vatican Secretary of State wrote that the danger that frightens us the most is that of the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. As for Islam, this religion of violence has always made converts with the sword. After Muhammad's death, most Arabs abandoned Islam and the famous wars of apostasy were fought. Abu Bakr, the first caliph succeeding Muhammad, killed tens of thousands of former Muslims while re-imposing Islam. By the early 8th century, Islam's fierce warriors had conquered most of the Middle East, much of Africa, and had nearly taken Europe. Islam's violent nature is still seen in Muslim mobs screaming, Allah is great, and wreaking mayhem and murder upon non-Muslims. Islam is behind most terrorism worldwide. Today, Muslim mobs periodically massacre thousands of Christians, loot and burn their property. In Sudan, millions of black Christians in the south are being starved, enslaved and murdered by the Islamic government in the north. Yes, Crusaders slaughtered Jews while waving the cross. But that was contrary to Christ's teaching and example. Muslim terrorists, however, murder in obedience to Allah, in obedience to the Koran and to Muhammad's teaching and example. All Islamic scholars agree, it is the sacred duty of every Muslim in every age to fight holy war whenever possible, to force the entire world to submit to Islam. There are more than 100 verses in the Quran about fighting and killing in that quest. World media persists in describing Islam as a peace-loving religion. Britain's Prime Minister Tony Blair has called Islam synonymous with, quote, peace, tolerance, and a force for good, unquote. Other Western political leaders repeatedly praise Islam's peace-loving ways, as do many church leaders. The unprecedented acts of war by terrorists against the United States September 11th brought statements by leaders to the effect that we must distinguish between terrorism perpetrated by extremist fanatical groups and Islam itself, which is peaceful. Author Tom Clancy said that Islam as a religion does not condone violence, an incredible statement in view of the teachings of the Quran of Muhammad and the unbroken record of violence in spreading Islam throughout history. This very sentimental reaction has encouraged terrorism. For such criminals, Arafat is proof that terrorism brings great reward. He is the most vicious and successful terrorist in history. His PLO held the record for the largest hijacking, four aircraft in a single operation, 
which has just been equaled. The largest number of hostages held at one time, 300, and other records that still stand. The largest number of people shot at an airport. The largest ransom collected, $5 million paid by Lufthansa. The greatest variety of targets, 40 civilian passenger aircraft, five passenger ships, 30 embassies or diplomatic missions, plus innumerable fuel depots and factories, etc. Instead of being brought to trial by an international tribunal like Nazis and Serbian leadership, Arafat's bloody exploits brought the United Nations, European Union, and countless world political and religious leaders on his side against Israel and earned for him the Nobel Peace Prize. What gives skilled pilots the courage and determination to seize control of a jetliner and fly it into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, or for others to blow themselves up on a bus in Tel Aviv? Only one thing, the fact that to die in jihad guarantees paradise. For martyrs, Islam promises a palace of ivory inside of which are 70 mansions, and inside each mansion 70 houses, and in each house a bed on which are 70 sheets, and on each sheet a beautiful virgin who regains her virginity each time he has sex with her. He has promised that he will have the appetite and strength of 100 men for food and sex. This promise is fed to Muslim boys from earliest childhood and is what gives them the reckless courage to train and execute terrorist deeds in which they sacrifice their lives in bringing death and destruction to those who are called the enemies of Allah. When will the world recognize that Islam is the culprit? And when will Muslims who abhor terrorism realize that they are followers of a terrorist religion as history proves? Muslims have continually tortured, murdered, and fought one another. In the eight-year war between Iran and Iraq, a thousand tons of poison gas were used and deaths numbered more than in World War I. In PLO territories taken over from Israel, there is no freedom of conscience, of speech, of religion, or of the press, no democratic vote, nor is there in any Muslim country. In Saudi Arabia, where Islam began, no Jew is allowed. Only Muslims can be citizens. No non-Islamic place of worship may be built. And it is by universal Islamic law, officially the death penalty, for a Muslim to convert to any other religion. One cannot carry a Bible in the street in Saudi Arabia or have a Bible study in one's home. Yet. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the West. More people worship in mosques in Britain than in Christian churches. Associated with many mosques inside America are secret bases training terrorists for jihad to turn the U.S. into an Islamic state. Islam rejects the biblical God, denies Christ's divinity or that he died for our sins, claims that a look-alike disciple died on the cross in Christ's place that he was taken alive to heaven and must return to earth to die one day. Christianity is to be suppressed by force. The Quran says, slay the idolaters, that is non-Muslims, wherever you find them, besiege them, fight against such as believe not in Allah. Take a good look. This is Islam. Yet Robert Schuller has said that if he came back in 100 years and found that all of his descendants were Muslims, it wouldn't bother him. He preached a 1999 Christmas season message in the Grand Mosque in Damascus with Islam's Grand Mufti holding his hand. Schuller ecstatically told Larry King that he felt, quote, an immediate kinship of spirit and an agreement of faith and philosophy, unquote, with this anti-Christian Muslim leader. The Bible says God gave the promised land to his chosen people, the Jews. Islam says Allah gave that land to the Arabs. Unfolding before us is an awesome showdown between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who loves the Jews, and the God of Muhammad, who hates the Jews and calls for their destruction. The real battle is not between Jew and Arab 
but between the God of the Bible, whose name is Yahweh, and the God of the Quran, whose name is Allah. Twelve times in the Bible, God calls himself, quote, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, unquote. Yahweh declared to Moses, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Satan is the inspirer of 3,000 years of anti-Semitism. If the Jews were destroyed, Messiah could not be born, even after Christ came. If Satan could destroy the Jews, Yahweh would be a liar, unable to fulfill his promises to restore Israel to its land, for Christ to reign over them on David's throne at his second coming. God's integrity is linked to the survival of Israel. Not mentioned once in the Quran, Jerusalem is found more than 800 times in the Bible. It is repeatedly declared to be where Yahweh, the God of the Bible, has placed his name forever. Yasser Arafat claims that Jerusalem has been an Arab city for thousands of years. In fact, it never was. On July 15, 1889, the Pittsburgh Dispatch reported that of Jerusalem's 40,000 residents, 30,000 were Jews and most of the others were Christians. At the time Israel declared its independence in 1948, there were 100,000 Jews living in the ancient city. Jerusalem was founded 3,000 years ago by Israel's great King David and has been a Jewish city ever since. No less than 40 times the Bible calls Jerusalem, quote, the city of David, unquote. There, God established David's throne forever. And on that throne, the Messiah, descended from David, must reign over Israel and the world. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jerusalem is a cup of trembling because world leaders reject the God of the Bible and his peace plan for Jerusalem and the world. The insistence by the Vatican and the United Nations that Jerusalem must be an international city and by the Muslims that it belongs to them defies the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as does the Muslim passion to destroy Israel. Muslim nations are arming themselves with missiles capable of delivering chemical, biological, and nuclear warheads. These are not defensive weapons. The whole world knows they have one purpose, to rain death and destruction upon Israel. Syria has manufactured thousands of chemical warheads, has huge stores of biological weapons, and has tripled its military and air power since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Israel, too, has nuclear weapons, now deployed in new efficient submarines, and would not go down to defeat without using them. Is this what Christ meant when in a remarkable prophecy they anticipated modern weapons, he warned of such incredible destruction that if he did not intervene to stop it, no flesh would be left alive on earth? And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Armageddon is the subject of frequent Bible prophecies. The conditions described in the Bible leading up to Armageddon are clear. Millions of Jews have returned to Israel after being scattered to all nations. They have rebuilt Israel from wilderness and feel secure in a false peace. As the false peace process continues, Arabs murder and torch the homes of fellow Arabs suspected of cooperating with Israel. Muslim terrorists who kill Jews are honored in Arab countries by having streets and holidays named after them. The Palestinian Prize for Culture was awarded at the turn of the new millennium to Abu Dawood for the book he wrote telling how he planned and executed the murder 
of 11 Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics. Yet Israelis dream on of peace with those who have sworn to exterminate them. Just ahead lies what Jeremiah called, quote, the time of Jacob's trouble, unquote. The armies of the world, led by Antichrist, will be brought to Armageddon by Yahweh to punish them for their hatred, persecution, and slaughter of his people Israel, and to discipline Israel for her unbelief. And you shall come up against my people of Israel in the latter days. I will bring you against my land, that the nations may know me, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. The phrases, my presence, and the Lord shall go forth and fight, indicate that God himself will come to Armageddon to rescue Israel. Zechariah says, God comes as a resurrected man who was pierced to the death. This can only be the Messiah, whom Isaiah calls, quote, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Listen again to Jewish prophets foretelling Messiah being rejected and crucified by his own people and dying for the sins of the world. They pierce my hands and my feet. He is despised and rejected, cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Then shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. In harmony with Israel's prophets, John's revelation of Armageddon in the last book of the Bible shows Christ returning from heaven to destroy Antichrist exactly as Paul also foretold. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his name is called the Word of God. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, cast alive into a lake of fire. Prior to Armageddon, Antichrist will confirm a seven-year covenant that will guarantee a false peace between Arab and Jew, promise security to Israel, allow her to rebuild the temple, and commence animal sacrifices after more than 1,900 years without them. Antichrist will break his covenant, stop the sacrifices, put his image in the temple, declare that he is God, and demand to be worshipped. Those who refuse will die. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. The man of sin be revealed. He as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. As many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. What week is Gabriel referring to when this occurs? He told Daniel that at the end of 70 weeks of years, 490 years, all prophecies would be fulfilled. Israel would be fully restored and would never dishonor God again. At the end of the first 69 weeks of years, that's 483 years, Messiah would come and be cut off. The time would be counted from the date authorization to rebuild Jerusalem would be given by the king of Babylon. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Nehemiah says he received the authority to rebuild Jerusalem on Nisan first in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes, which was 445 BC. On Sunday, April 6, 32 AD, 
exactly 483 years to the day, now celebrated as Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, not on a white horse, leading an army to throw off Roman rule, as would-be messiahs attempted and the Jews hoped, but upon a donkey, humbly bringing salvation from sin as Zechariah had foretold. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon the foal of an ass. It was the 10th of Nisan, the day the Passover lambs were being taken from the flock when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, presenting himself to his people. On the 14th, when those lambs were being slain all over Israel, he, the Lamb of God, nailed to a cross, died for the sins of the world in fulfillment of Moses' prophecy. On the 14th, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, the lamb, in the evening. It is indisputable history that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey on the very day prophesied, was hailed as the Messiah, then rejected by Israel and crucified as her prophets had also foretold. As a result, God's plans for Israel in Daniel's 70th week were postponed. We live now in what Christ called, quote, the times of the Gentiles, unquote, with Jerusalem an international city dominated by non-Jews. Christ has been building his church, comprised of both Jews and Gentiles who believe in him. Only when that church has been raptured to heaven as Christ promised, will the 70th week begin to run its course. Israel is in deep moral and spiritual trouble. There is hostility between religious and secular Israelis and increasing disillusionment with Judaism, especially among youth. Israel is plagued with drugs, pornography, prostitution, youth rebellion, rape, robbery, and murder. Israel needs to repent to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what can the rabbis offer a repentant sinner? They've had no sacrifices for sin for 1900 years because of no temple, exactly as Hosea prophesied. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice. God prophesied this condition. Why would he allow his chosen people to be without a priesthood and temple to offer the sacrifices for sin, which he had prescribed? It makes sense only if Christ's sacrifice on the cross fulfilled all the Old Testament sacrifices. They are no longer needed. Otherwise, God has left his chosen people and the world without provision for sin, something he would never do. The Hebrew scriptures contain more than 300 prophecies telling when and where the Messiah would be born and how to recognize him when he came. All of these were specifically fulfilled to the letter in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. If he is not the Messiah, there is no Messiah, for he is the very one who on the exact day the angel Gabriel foretold to Daniel, rode into Jerusalem, was hailed as the Messiah, and then rejected and crucified as to Jewish prophets foretold. According to Israel's own scriptures, it is 1900 years too late to expect the first coming of the Messiah. Israel's only hope is his second coming. We may be certain that having brought Israel to birth, God will complete his purpose. He declares, Shall a nation be born? Shall I bring to birth, saith the Lord, and shut the womb? Tragically, it will take Armageddon for most Jews to believe in their Messiah. When Yahweh personally appears to rescue Israel as the world's armies are about to destroy her, they will see at last that he is a man who was pierced to the death for their sins and resurrected the very Messiah promised by their prophets, whom they have rejected. Then all Israel still alive will believe. But for all those, Jew and Gentile, who die without believing in him, there is tragically no hope.